Once again, another very wonderful morning on out there to all of you, my dear friends. I'm ever so thankful once again that you welcome join me. We left off in Zechariah 4 with the t uh, showing of the vision of the two olive trees with the golden candlestick right there, seven golden candlesticks. Well, we left off with that, and now we're picking up in another vision. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll or a scroll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Such scrolls for writing were usually longer than they were broad. So this was represented as ten yards in length and five in breadth. The roll was very large to show what a number of curses would come upon the wicked. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stilleth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. The breach of one commandment of each table of the law. Every one that stilleth and so breaks the eighth commandment in the second table of the two tables of the Ten Commandments. Everyone that sweareth, i.e. falsely by God's name, and so breaks the third commandment in the first table, take not the Lord's name in vain, is singled out, perhaps because these were then the most prevalent sins among the Jews, stealing and swearing. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. Here we have the people in whom steal and those in whom swear. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, meaning a curse will come upon them, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof, which is implying the house itself, everything about them, everything that you own, everything will have a curse. Have you ever fallen away from God, backslidden, and suddenly your whole life, everything, like even your TV messes up everything tears up and it's a uh, uh, pretty it's kind of like this it's a curse placed upon you then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth so here's something new and i said what is it and he said this is an ephah that goeth forth he said moreover this is their resemblance through all the earth now, an ephah was basically, it's a unit of measure, and it's pretty much like two handfuls, an ephah. And we'll see how in this vision, it's actually expanded to be something much larger. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is the lid. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. So there's a woman in this much larger ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. This woman, she is called wickedness, and she's forced into this ephah, and then the lid is closed over. When the leaden lid was raised, one woman was seen in the measure. She is called one, as uniting and concentrating in her person all sinners and all sins. An ephah was consequently too small for a woman to sit in. We must therefore understand here a measure in the form only of an ephah, but of a larger size, which was probably the reason why Zechariah did not know what it was. And being the measure whereby they bought and sold dry things... It seems to have been intended to denote the unjust dealings of the Jews in buying and selling their fraud, deceit, and extortion in commerce were sins abounding among them. So right here we're seeing how the Jews are being told to straighten up, not just the world. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. So these women have wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. So they're taking this ephah with this woman, and where are they taking her? Then said I to the angel that talked with me, where did these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar. 
Jerusalem to Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. According to Genesis 10, Shinar is the land in which Nimrod founded the first empire and where the human race built the Tower of Babel, which was to reach to the sky. The name is not to be taken geographically here as an epithet applied to Mesopotamia, but it is a notional or real definition, which affirms that the ungodliness carried away out of the sphere of the people of God will have its permanent settlement in the sphere of the imperial power that is hostile to God. Okay, now for one of my favorite Bible chapters, period. And it's very short. It's not a long chapter whatsoever. Zechariah 6. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of brass. And the first chariot were red horses. And the second chariot, black horses. Now, before we go any further, let's just see what's happening right here. What are these horses, brass mountains? The main design of this eighth and last vision is to confirm the Jews and their faith in and dependence upon God by showing them that weak and defenseless as they seemed to be, they had nothing to fear from the greatest earthly powers while they remained under the divine protection of God. Since all those powers originally proceeded from the councils of the Almighty, how God always says, well, he sends Babylon first during the captivity. He's, he sends uh, the Babylonians to conquer uh, the Jews. And then he sends the Medes and Persians to conquer Babylon after 70 years. So uh, all of these are within the power of God. He's one. Of the, and that's basically what's been said, right? Originally proceeded from the councils of the Almighty were the instruments of his providence and could not subsist nor act but under his permission. God lifts up kings and he tears them down. So either way, uh, we should all keep this lesson in mind about how God, he, he is in control. And in the third chariot, white horses and the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses, meaning stout, very stout. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses, which are therein, go forth into the north country. Okay, now keep this north country in mind. And the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. The business of these angels, and that's what these are, angels, is to do God's will in all the earth. Not in one part only, but everywhere, whithersoever they are sent. And you can also see this spoken of with the four winds back in Daniel 7's vision. This is all just clarification on the world events, how God has controlled these of all the nations of the world. And uh, speaking also of the end times, which will come to even by the very end of this chapter in a very momentous way. And the bay or stout horses went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Very important right there. What is this north country? Well, it's very obvious who it is. In Jeremiah, though, we can actually find contextually whom that this is, even though there are other nations referred to as the north. But in this context, Jeremiah 25, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them, this kingdom of the north, Babylonians, against this land, uh, Jerusalem, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolation. So the north is Babylon. And God says that these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. So Babylon, because it has now been conquered by the Medes and Persians, God's wrath is satisfied now. Babylon alone of the four great world kingdoms had in Zechariah's time been finally punished. 
Remember Daniel 7 as well as Zechariah. Therefore, in its case alone, does God now say his anger is satisfied. The others had as yet to expiate their sin. The fourth has still to do so. We are right now in the fourth kingdom, which began at the time of Christ. And it has been this buildup of this new world order beginning with Rome, of course, but this new world order build up is represented as the fourth kingdom, which will come. So just remember, God's wrath is satisfied because the Babylonians have been conquered and his people have come back. And we'll see um, more significance right here in just a second. I'll come to it. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, take of them of the captivity, even of Heldai, of Tobijah, and of Jediah, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Now what is going on right here? I'll summarize it right here in just a second. This is astonishing. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch... And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. What is going on right here? Something incredibly important. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory. Meaning that the glory will rest upon this branch. And shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. Now what priest sits upon a throne? Kings sit upon thrones, so this man is a priest and a king. And the council of peace shall be between them both, priest and king, united in the Messiah. Well, just to summarize real, real quick what uh, Zechariah is saying, he says that he is to go to these three Jews, and the three named came from Babylon, where some of the exiled Jews still were left, to present gifts of silver and gold towards the building of the temple. Crowns are directed to be made of them with their silver and gold. He's to take their silver and gold and make crowns, then to be set on Joshua's head and to be deposited in the temple as a memorial of the donors until Messiah shall appear. Take note of the sequence of events playing out here. The north... Babylon is conquered. God's wrath is satisfied. Then Joshua, the high priest, is being given a crown or crowns, actually many crowns, several. Contextually lumped in with the messianic label branch and told how he would build the temple. Now, we know that Joshua, the high priest back then, he didn't build the temple. He played a part in encouraging the people and residing over it. But we're told about how this one will come and... And whom this Joshua is just a shadow of, he will build the temple. These things are obviously pointing those of our day to end time events. In Revelation, the whole world is called Babylon. Okay, so whenever it says that Babylon is destroyed back then and God's wrath was satisfied by the Medes, by him drawing the Medes and Persians down to conquer them. Well, this is all that was all very small things happening and showing on the world scale what will happen in our day. In Revelation, the whole world is called Babylon. God's wrath will destroy her, which he'll destroy the whole world. Jesus, the branch, another name for Joshua, wears the crowns, builds his temple, and will sit upon his throne as both king and high priest. Something very astonishing is happening right here in the book of Zechariah. You see Joshua, the name Joshua and Jesus, the same names. They even have the same definition, which is Je Jehovah's salvation. The word Jesus is the Latin form of the Greek Esos, which in turn is the transliteration of the Hebrew Joshua, or again, Jehoshua, meaning Jehovah's salvation. This is pretty much like the Old Testament. It is the Old Testament naming the true messiah jesus he they're actually telling this branch his name is joshua which also can be called jesus fascinating now some people believe that there's meaning in the names of these men and whom the silver and gold is taken from taking the meaning of the names heldai means robust tobijah means god's goodness and jediah means god knows 
McGee sees the intention that God knows that through his goodness, he will put his king on the throne and he will do it in a robust manner. Now, that's just theory, but I mean, there could very well be meaning behind that. And the crown shall be to Helam and to Tobijah and to Jediah and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. So it does say that these crowns will be there for a memorial to these men, which I believe that's the main reason for them, specifically their names being mentioned. Because he actually did go, Zechariah did go and gather the silver and gold from these men, and they're honored in this manner. That's what I would guess. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, I've already alluded to whenever Isaiah prophesies of the, uh, the branch. And right here we see in Zechariah the branch, which is the Messiah. But I'd also like to point you all to Jeremiah 23 in particular, where he speaks of this branch as well. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgments and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, speaking of Christ, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. There is no righteousness in, in us. It's all on the Lord. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries, whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Speaking of Babylon, once again, this north country is being mentioned, and there's saying that this will be said of his deliverance. And remember how in Revelation we're told Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And I believe that this is much more pointing to how he saves them at the Battle of Armageddon, Israel. And you can also apply this to the whole church as well, being saved from the world. But my dear friends, that is it for today's study. I hope that you all learned something and you see how Zechariah, there's just so much within this little book and the very end of the Old Testament. I thank you all for joining me. Lord of peace be with you. Amen.